so our next speaker is um, Heiko Pelika, who uh, has long history with um, IODP. Um, and um, he's going to talk about the Arctic, where I, I believe he served as polar bear, potential polar bear fodder um, on, the, uh, on, on the drill ship. Um, so I'll just pass this over to, to Heiko. Great. Uh, thanks for the great talk, Joanne. I really enjoyed that. Uh, and thanks to the organizing committee for getting this workshop going again, despite uh, um, have this having to be a virtual meeting. I was present um, at the 2018 meeting, and I think I was really uh, enthused about the ideas that people had about new proposals and also the kind of working together that makes uh, so much what uh, ocean drilling really is. And I'm excited to see what uh, ideas people come up, come up with for uh, this workshop. And so um, what uh, Damon, Jude and Roz and others uh, asked me to do today is to um, revisit um, an expedition that I joined uh, as a very young or very new lecturer in Southampton. I just finished a postdoc uh, with Jan Backman in Sweden. And that's also where this interest in joining this uh, first uh, MSP expedition uh, came from. And uh, so I'm going to talk a um, little bit about the um, results from ASEX, um, focusing a little bit on the logistical challenges, because I think that's really something that needs to be considered for um, any kind of future uh, expeditions to that area. And then uh, courtesy uh, Rudig from Rüdiger Stein, I'm also going to introduce some of the concepts and new questions, scientific questions that uh, are hopefully going to be addressed by the kind of follow-up um, expedition, ARCOP, uh, which hopefully, I'm not sure whether it's the latest, but hope, hopefully will be uh, implemented in uh, 2022 as expedition uh, 377. So I must say this was really, uh, I've been on a few IDP expeditions, um, but I think this is probably one of the most memorable ones um, just because of the a huge challenge of actually getting to the place, uh, staying over the uh, drill hole and getting material out of an area that has pretty much been uncovered um, apart from the, in terms of drilling, apart from the uppermost uh, few meters uh, prior uh, to this expedition. Um, can you guys see this, uh, my screens, by the way? If I don't hear to the contrary. Yes. I do, so. Great. Okay, so um, just looking outside right now in Bremen, it didn't last two or three years, we had no snow. Uh, and it's quite um, um, topical to talk about the Arctic um, because um, it really does influence um, not just uh, global climate, but also certainly the uh, conditions in mid latitude uh, areas. So right now we have, I think minus eight degrees Celsius predicted to be, I don't know, minus 12 or minus 15 later this week. Um, and we have 20 or 30 centimeters of snow, which is you know, very rare in Bremen to get this much snow. And the reason is that this year, once again, um, we have a split of the polar vortex, which in the last uh, few years has very much caused um, uh, wintry conditions all the way down to Florida in the US mostly, but this year we also have it here in Europe. And this is related to um, the um, splitting up of the polar vortex, which is normally a kind of strat strat stratospheric wind system, which uh, entrains um, Arctic uh, polar air uh, over the um, uh, Arctic area. And once in a while, uh, this um, can get disturbed by the influx of um, warmer winds uh, from the south and eventually leading to the splitting off of some of these uh, vortices that go around the Arctic. And uh, this is kind of a nice example for uh, how conditions and um, processes in the Arctic directly influence uh, also the, the wider climate. And the links you will see later on, I'm going to make are perhaps more related to the oceanic gateways, but this is the atmospheric side and uh, we can probably perhaps expect more uh, about uh, more processes like these in the future, according to, to certain models. So this is the current map of all drilled holes of the various drilling programs that Ross so nicely uh, summarized. And the point about the Arctic is that there has really been uh, so far only one expedition, and that was ASEX in 2004. Um, and you'll see in a moment why it is difficult to go there. And while even in the future, it will still be difficult to go there. 
most of the other Arctic related expeditions, at least the ones in the Arctic Circle, have been um, further south uh, around Greenland, uh, where actually the Joiders uh, managed to drill quite a few holes. Uh, but if you really want to study the um, conditions and the sediments from the central Arctic Ocean, um, you need to mount a, a fairly sophisticated logistical um, procedure. And uh, you can see here, just for reference, also what I'll talk about at the end of this talk, the location along the Lomonosov Ridge here, this um, old uh, broken off piece of continental crust um, in the expedition that Rüdiger Stein and Christen St. John uh, have been designated coaches for uh, the so-called ARCOP expedition or expedition uh, 377. So I'm just going to very briefly in one or two slides remind people about the overall kind of climatic effects and climatic history that we're trying to uh, solve from uh, or by looking at uh, sediments in the past, most of them, at least for the older geological time periods, recovered through um, uh, ocean drilling, which is the only means uh, to access this material. Um, then I'm going to um, go a little bit through the overall setting of the Arctic Ocean because that is relevant for the kind of scientific questions that we are asking uh, when we go there to drill. Um, then I want to show um, just a few slides uh, about how we actually uh, do the ice breaking um, and how you know, the logistical challenges that are involved in, in getting to this. This is actually a picture I took from the Vida Viking that Damon mentioned earlier. Um, while we were on station and you can see once in a while you get these huge lumps of broken off uh, sea ice um, which uh, threatens to push uh, the drill ship or the drill vessel uh, off station. Um, and then uh, I think a lot of the ASICS results really show up in the future ARCOP plans because um, you know, that's the kind of basis uh, for developing new questions um, of what we still need to find out. Um, just a reminder in terms of uh, CO2, of course, the typical glacial interglacial um, change between um, um, or in CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere are uh, between around 180 and 280 ppm. And we know that uh, since uh, pre-industrial times, this has rapidly uh, increased much faster than uh, many uh, geological time periods in the past. I'll show that in a moment. And um, just as a reminder, this was the uh, last time I, um, I think, updated the slides uh, related to A6 in terms of CO2. So you can see this went to, to 2008. And I just looked again yesterday. Now, of course, we're already here at 412, I think. And so that's a huge change, even in this short time period from 2008 to 2020. Um, that is, um, you know, uh, at least in the order of, of magnitude of the typical glacial interglacial change. Um, that has long been the argument uh, to do ocean drilling into um, time periods much older uh, than the uh, Pleistocene or the Pliocene. Uh, and uh, one of the more recent compilations by Gavin Foster, you can see here on this nice from his nice uh, website, shows that really to um, experience or to sample those conditions in the past that are probably relevant for the uh, medium term and long term future on our planet really are in the Miocene or maybe Oligocene uh, going back in time. And that's one of the uh, still um, great motivating uh, features um, that's uh, also included in the new uh, science framework that uh, Ross presented. Um, of course, one other very important aspect um, from a climate point of view, but also from an implementation uh, point of view is the um, role of sea ice and the coverage of sea ice in the uh, Arctic area. Uh, this is an animation by uh, NASA that shows the time evolution of uh, the sea ice minimum area uh, in the Arctic Ocean. And you can see here that this really um, over the years, over the last few decades, uh, did decrease uh, quite significantly. This is the kind of annual uh, fluctuation in the, in the sea ice. And once we approach the last uh, 20 years or so, this really uh, does go down quite dramatically, uh, which on the one hand uh, shows the um, important role of sea ice um, and records thereof that we might generate from uh, ocean drilling on the global climate system, but also from an implement implementation point of view, um, the less ice there is um, in summer, the easier it is kind of to access uh, some of these 
um, parts. And economically, of course, the Northwest Passage, for example, that goes uh, through here um, also would play a very important role in shortening shipping times uh, and so on as we go uh, forward. And uh, I think it's always surprising to see uh, how far the actual observed values uh, kind of lie below various uh, climatic models that have been uh, addressed. And uh, oh, thanks, 415 ppm, someone just wrote in the, in the chat. Um, and you can see here um, from last year's uh, minimum sea ice, again, we are you know, following a trajectory that is uh, kind of steeper downwards than uh, some of these emission scenarios that were underlying uh, IPCC uh, reports uh, more recently. And this is actually the minimum sea ice from September 2020. You can see here basically only the central part is, is kind of covered, but even there, even at the North Pole, I think they are now uh, as experienced by the um, Polarstern mosaic expedition uh, that froze inside the ice and drifted uh, southwards. Uh, there are many places that are now um, very thinly covered with leads and actually accessible by, um, by uh, the rightly equipped um, set of uh, ships. Okay, let's uh, talk uh, very briefly um, about the physiography of the Arctic Ocean because this again plays a a major role in um, how the uh, teleconnections uh, work to um, link the climatic evolution of the planet as a whole with what has been happening or is happening in the Arctic. Um, the um, Arctic basin, the central basin, is actually a relatively small basin um, and uh, it's kind of unique in that it has um, a very shallow and a also not quite so deep connection to the largest um, world's oceans, to the Pacific through the Bering Strait and uh, to the Atlantic through the um, uh, Fram Strait. And uh, these, certainly the Fram Strait uh, rich evolution is quite complicated and there's still some debate on when this deepened and, and how this deepened. But these are the two major inflows and outflows of um, uh, less saline water from the Arctic into the North Atlantic, for example, which uh, we know controls the overall circulation system and the strength of the meridional overturning circulation. Um, and then there are added questions related to the role of the Arctic uh, on the overall oceanic circulation patterns through the influx from various uh, river systems, which I'll talk about um, towards the end of the uh, presentation. Um, there are two main components to the sea ice uh, motion inside the Arctic. Uh, they're mostly wind driven and the two main features are a uh, kind of circular uh, clockwise pattern uh, called the Beaufort gyre uh, and then another feature the transpolar drift which basically moves uh, all of this um, ice uh, southwards and this is basically the, the trajectory that the polage tent took um, during the last year when it was frozen in the in the sea ice um, and this is the main transport way of material and also outwards uh, of, out of the uh, arctic ocean and in terms of uh, teleconnections and climatic patterns uh, this is a um, quite uh, old paper now by driscoll and hauck uh, who kind of argued that there is a, a set of teleconnections between various um, 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 processes relating to river discharge uh, into the Arctic, the outflow of low salinity uh, Arctic uh, waters, uh, moisture transport in the atmospheric system, and then the interaction of all of these uh, into the uh, conveyor belt uh, ocean circulation. And uh, this is certainly a pattern that has uh, now been developed scientifically. Um, in the last uh, recent years, there have been a number of papers that focus specifically on the uh, connection between the Arctic and the Atlantic. And uh, I think there are many questions still unresolved of uh, how this quite complex interplay between basin subsidence in the Arctic, um, specifically related to the uh, Fram Strait and uh, the uh, water movements um, are controlling um, weather patterns and climatic patterns uh, more globally. Um, I'm showing here an old um, compilation of isotope data, which has since been updated uh, quite dramatically by uh, Thomas Westerholt uh, et al. last year in the science paper. I'm showing this just to show what we knew about the um, Xenozoic uh, climatic evolution in terms of deep water temperatures as derived by 
uh, benthic forums, for example, or also the global carbon cycle in terms of the delta carbon 13 uh, signal. Um, but before we went on A6, so this paper is from 2001, and at that time we knew basically, or well, we had some small records from, as I mentioned, the surface parts of the sediments in the ocean, some older fragments that were recovered, um, but basically from the Arctic Ocean proper or from the Arctic sediments, um, nothing was known other than these small uh, fragments. So it was really um, a dive into the you know, unknown, uh, apart from kind of um, reconstructions of seismics and tectonics that uh, gave us at least some idea of how old uh, some of these successions and rocks uh, might be. And so uh, we only um, had limited insights on when sea ice formed, what the long-term temperature reliability was, past fluxes of materials, particularly ice rafted material, uh, and generally the Arctic's role in the global evolution of past climates and environments. And so that's where the plan for ASICS uh, really came from. It's um, really uh, based on uh, um, a lot of uh, seismic work that the RV group in particular, and also the Swedes, have done in the um, past few decades and the actual location on the Lomonosov Ridge, I mentioned this is a broken off piece of continental crust, um, an ice seismic uh, ridge with some quite complicated tectonic evolution uh, over time, but uh, this uh, seismic profile that uh, um, was found um, on the cruises uh, led by uh, Wilfred Jokart et al. Uh, showed this nice kind of pancake uh, layered sediment package, uh, which uh, was targeted for the initial proposal uh, for ASEX, and it seemed to be, you know, if drilling allowed, and that was always the, the main um, big question mark um, prior to the expedition, uh, potentially would allow the recovery of sediments that at that time were assumed to stretch back from the present all the way back into the Paleocene or maybe even into the uh, Cretaceous. And so uh, the seismic data effectively showed a five, roughly 500 meter uh, thick sediment pile. And the advantage of being on this uh, Lomonosov ridge here is that the water depth is only about 1200 meters as opposed to the 4000 meters or so you get in the uh, basins uh, surrounding this. So just to quickly go through the history of the, of the idea. So the uh, seismic lines were taken in 1991 some more detailed so, uh, survey work, work was done in 1996. And then the first uh, initial um, um, submission of a proposal was in 1998. Um, and then you can actually see because this was uh, ranked quite highly because of its um, uh, novel uh, nature, uh, it fitted in quite nicely also with this new idea of mission specific platforms. It went quite quickly from in IDP terms from the um, proposal submission uh, to the actual implementation in 2004. And um, so um, it was really exciting after some hiccups and delays. I think I remember I rebooked my flight ticket uh, to join this as a shipboard scientist two times, at least maybe three times. Um, it was still cheaper than having a flexible ticket. Um, anyway, we met uh, or the fleet of ships met uh, at the Ice Age in, in the early August uh, 2004 and uh, we uh, completed the expedition uh, in mid-September uh, 2004. And uh, I think I'm going to give you some impressions, maybe how this works logistically, because this is really important to remember also for future expeditions. It's despite the um, decreasing sea ice cover, um, still in my mind, very logistically challenging to um, stay on station for uh, long periods of time, which is what will be required to, to get nice uh, sediment records. So the strategy that was uh, implemented for ASEX was to um, operate with a fleet of three ships. Um, here we have the nuclear powered icebreaker Sovietsky Soyuz, and that was really doing the, the grunt work of breaking up uh, larger uh, ice flows. Um, then we had the Odin, which served as the first of all the science base. Uh, for the limited number of, of shipboard scientists that we had. Um, so this is where the um, analytical work was done on core catches, um, because I think that's also worthwhile mentioning and the way this was implemented in terms of drilling, none of the cores was, were actually split on the ships or during the expedition. 
uh, but uh, as has now been established as the kind of normal procedure for many MSP expeditions that is normally done during the sampling party uh, here back in Bremen. Um, but nevertheless, that also makes it quite difficult, of course, to assess what material has been recovered and what the um, modifications to the drilling strategy uh, and so on um, should, should be if unexpected results uh, are found. Um, the Odin also served as a, a kind of cleanup icebreaker, so it would uh, protect the drill ship um, and break up the smaller pieces that the Sovietsky Soyuz left behind. And then the actual drilling was done by this converted um, ice hardened uh, uh, drill rig supply ship, uh, the Vida Viking, with a um, purpose fitted um, drill rig um, that uh, was suitable for the water depth uh, that we anticipated. And so the challenge, of course, was to stay on station in drifting ice. The uh, speed of the ice drift is actually um, not negligible. And I think it's between two to four kilometers an hour. And if you get some of these very large blocks pushing against the ship, then uh, you can't push it away. You can only break it. And this, of course, has to stay on station with the tool rig in place. So that's the main uh, challenge. And I think without, at that time at least, a nuclear icebreaker, we also would not have been able to um, stay on station for the time periods uh, that we did. And so I think it still needs to be established whether anything less than this kind of three ship scenario is really operationally uh, possible. Um, I would be surprised if, if it was. Um, I think you really need this kind of um, thing together with the additional helicopter survey flights, uh, GPS tracking of buoys that are installed by helicopters on various flows because this um, drift can actually also change direction quite suddenly. Um, and um, so you, you know, instead of breaking upstream the ice, uh, you might find yourself suddenly downstream, which is then a big problem because the actual drill ship again remains unprotected. This is the way towards the first site. You can see this is the kind of ice cube factory that we set up with these three uh, vessels. And uh, it's just to really show you that it's quite a big challenge uh, to, um, uh, to keep these uh, ships on station and to even get there in the first instance. So nevertheless, and it took about three days from the ice edge to the site. And so that actually went all very smoothly. You can see here the, the track we left from Tromso, and then we met the, um, the uh, Russian icebreaker at the ice edge, and then moved to the uh, final coring site here. And uh, from a helicopter point of view, this is what it looks like. Uh, we have the three vessels again. You can see here, this is uh, kind of what I described before, the uh, nuclear icebreaker uh, chomping up the larger uh, several hundred meter to kilometer size flows that leaves these kind of fragments behind, which then the Odin uh, cleans up. And meanwhile, the uh, drill ship stays on station and is orientated towards the um, main uh, ice flow direction um, and uh, tries to stay there. Just as a, because the time is pretty short and there's uh, still a few more slides to go through just quickly. Uh, we did actually core uh, around uh, 500 meters. Um, um, of which uh, 339 meters were recovered. Um, total depth to basement was about 430 meters. Um, and I should say also this was actually split um, across primarily two uh, single hole uh, sites, which make up a, a composite record. Um, the crustal uh, basement age was confirmed to be um, just latest um, uh, well, around 57 uh, million years. Um, there's a Y-line log that was also, also run for the upper half of the record. Um, and uh, interestingly, we also actually recovered the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum, uh, which um, I'll say a few more words about in a moment. So in terms of sedimentation rates, actually what was very surprising, I'll come back to that in a moment, was this um, quite long hiatus that um, was determined based on the uh, palynology and dynasis stratigraphy. Um, and there's actually some controversy at the moment still about the detailed age models. There's an alternative age model, which has which does not have a hiatus here based on rhenium and osmium isotope records, but 
at least in terms of the um, bias stratigraphy, there's a lot of reworking here. And so in my mind, this is probably still the um, more correct uh, H model uh, for this uh, record. Okay, um, there are some highlights. This is the H depth plot. Um, interestingly, we, um, the dinoflagellate uh, group, analogy group found this um, freshwater azola um, event um, in this horizon. A uh, lot of concentrated azola or duckweed fern spores, which um, at least in one uh, of the scientific outputs by um, Hank Brinkhaus et al. Um, was conjectured to um, have drawn down a very significant amount of CO2 at this time in the Arctic Ocean. Um, this is the marker for the uh, Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum uh, time horizon, and this is the overall uh, event. And there's actually very different sediments that were recovered. Um, below this um, uh, hiatus, um, there's a, a set of uh, silts and clays uh, with a very high biosilica uh, component. Uh, whereas the upper part is mostly still mostly clastic material and um, that really um, is important in terms of how the results are interpreted uh, in terms of the um, paleo environment. Um, there's also a very neat history of uh, IRD material that Kristen St. John published as part of this work. I'll show that uh, a little bit uh, later. Oh yeah, the important thing to, folk to stress here is that the entire sediment pile almost contains no carbonate material, which in paleoclimatic studies is the, normally the workhorse for all sorts of reconstructions based on forams, uh, coccoliths, and so on. That's all missing here. Um, there, um, is, there are very few uh, forams preserved in the uppermost um, layers. They, are all, they were all um, agglutinated, and so um, one has to be quite clever in terms of the proxies one uh, uses to um, develop the climatic reconstructions uh, from this area. And so a lot of the work that was done here is based on TEX-86 um, proxies and on, on uh, dinoflagellate material. Um, that's the main way to actually get information out of the uh, Arctic uh, sediments. So in the last few minutes of time I have available, I think I'm going to run a little bit um, uh, late, maybe five minutes, is just to show you uh, some of the questions that uh, are to be addressed as part of IDP Expedition 377, Arctic Ocean Paleoceanography, ARCOP. And so the overall goal is to find a uh, alternative place compared to A6 to um, address the recovery of a complete stratigraphic sedimentary record um, and to really um, look into those time intervals where um, A6 um, did not actually recover uh, material. Um, just to remind you that sits here along the Lomonosov Ridge towards Siberia and is in a similar uh, water depth. And um, the aim is to uh, cover um, certainly these time periods that are not addressed by ASEX. And you can see here, this is, I mentioned these two different H models uh, that have been proposed. Um, this would be the application of these H models on which records ASEX actually recovered in terms of sea surface temp temperature proxies, for instance. Um, and uh, I think the hope is of the uh, proponents, uh, Rüdiger Stein et al, um, that uh, with the sediment package that they discovered um, along the ridge and with um, a tweak in the age models that they can actually recover some of the components that are not present uh, on uh, the location where ASICS uh, was drilled. Um, there's a lot of scientific questions that are still unresolved and that this new expedition is aiming to uh, solve. So for example, the change from a euxinic to an oxic ocean, I think I showed you the interpretation uh, of the different um, uh, oxygenation states uh, from the, partly from the sediment that was recovered before. There's this really curious uh, zebra unit. This is what the actual split core looked like uh, that is unresolved as to what's its, um, its origin. Um, and uh, there's conjecture that is it is related to the opening of the um, of the deep water deeper water connection here between the uh, Arctic Ocean and the uh, North Atlantic. Um, there's also remaining questions about the extent and timing of the neogene quaternary circumarctic glaciations. There's a lot of work that um, uh, Martin Jakobson uh, in Sweden did on this based on. Uh, um, grounding of, of iceberg evidence that they found from sonar uh, work. 
and also I mentioned the important potential influence of the river discharge from Siberia into the Arctic Ocean, which is the main source for the low saline conditions uh, found there. That was just a paper uh, again in, in Nature, I think, last week that uh, tries to argue that there have been um, very low salinity conditions during um, glacial times uh, in the Arctic. And ARCOP, um, the site that was chosen, is actually in a kind of prime location to, uh, to sample that material and to perhaps uh, reconstruct the uh, oxygenation conditions uh, in the Arctic Basin uh, back in time. And this was really, would really also then um, address to competing hypotheses about the teleconnections that I showed before. Um, so instead of Driscoll and Haug, 1998, there's also uh, the kind of um, hypothesis put forward by Ping Chen Wang and others about the um, influence of the Tibetan uplift uh, on uh, discharge and on uh, climatic connections. And um, I think that will be quite exciting to see when this when this expedition is resolved. Uh, and then just quickly, the um, history of Arctic sea ice cover. Um, during ASEX, uh, we got a really intriguing record of these, um, of these uh, uh, clastic uh, sediments um, and the um, general record of uh, terrigenous sands. And the ASEX record, um, depending on which age model one uses, seems to suggest an onset of glaciation that is really much, much earlier than had previously been uh, thought, so sometime in the uh, mid-Eocene. And I think uh, to resolve this question better would really be a very important task of future drilling, because um, traditionally the view has been that the Arctic um, um, sea ice cover happened much later, maybe in the Pliocene, uh, but now there seems to be evidence from ASICS that this happened uh, much earlier. Um, and this is really interesting, and this is important to, to resolve with our future drilling. And so final slide, just a little bit late, is to show you the location of the uh, ARCOP in terms of the sediment package. So you can see here, uh, this is in some ways similar to, to ASEX, but uh, they uh, went through great lengths to sift through all the available um, um, seismic records to um, ideally, um, through a composite of two sites, uh, actually extend the stratigraphic uh, time period or time coverage uh, obtainable uh, through drilling here. Um, and uh, to achieve those, one would actually have to uh, drill quite deep. So that's going to be the main challenge, I think, because to stay on the station uh, long enough to have these very long uh, records will require not just ideal uh, sea ice conditions, but probably also um, luck um, as far as the uh, mechanics is concerned. So I'll be excited to see um, how this expedition uh, turns out. And uh, that's all I have for now. Uh, let's see. Was it expected that no carbonate would have been present for lower part? Well, it was simply not known what was uh, going to be found, certainly on present day conditions of sedimentation in the um, Arctic. Um, it was not expected to uh, have much carbonate. That's why on the shipboard, most of the um, specialists uh, were um, based on, I think even with some last minute changes based on um, palynology and uh, diatoms, rads and so on. There was one um, nanofossil specialist on board and his only message every single time he checked in the core catcher was barren. And he was very, um, he was rather disappointed. Um, Steve Bahati asks, are there any key technical lessons learned from ASEX that are being will be taken into account for ARCOP drilling? I think Dave McEnroy will be the uh, prime candidate to answer that question. Um, certainly, I think one lesson from ASEX was that the um, logistics of getting to the drilling location uh, and um, staying on station worked much better than expected, but there were a lot of technical difficulties with broken down equipment and frozen things, which you know, I think I expected maybe as a, uh, if you go to an area like this for the very first time. Um, but I think there are a lot of lessons that can be learned and hopefully will have been learned. I think a lot will also depend on the right choice of drill rig uh, for this, um, which is um, fitted out um, 
appropriately to, to work in, in these old conditions. Um, do you have containers for analysis on board? So yeah, I was one, there were six scientists that um, flew back and forth by helicopter between the um, Odin that you see here in the middle and the Vida Viking on the right. Um, and that was basically just for stratigraphic correlation and a bunch of containers at the back of the, or one or two containers at the back of the Vida Viking to sample ephemeral uh, properties. So multi-sensor track scanning for stratigraphic correlation and um, um, geochemistry, so taking rhizome samples uh, and so on. Um, and the core catch analysis was done on the Odin. Um, the container situation at the back of the Vida Viking, where I spent most of my shift time, was uh, generally okay. Temperature was normally between zero and plus five in the container. Um, so one has to uh, put on several layers of pants to, um, uh, to feel reasonably comfortable. But I think the excitement of doing this uh, overweighs that. Okay, thank you, um, Heiko, for a very entertaining um, adventure across the Arctic. Um, and, and of course, um, you know, we, uh, you know, all look forward to the uh, return expedition to, to that part of the world. And, um, you know, this, of course, you know, 302 was the first mission specific platform. And uh, so it was an amazing uh, challenge to, um, to, to, to put this together. Um,